let's continue our discussion of thermal simulation. I want to talk about larger projects like you'd be des designing in studio this semester. Uh, one thing that uh, is important to discuss when we talk about larger projects is how much buildings have changed in the last 50 or 70 years. Uh, the building on the left is obviously the Guggenheim Museum. It's a section uh, cut and the pochade envelope, the black, is kind of accurate. It's concrete and steel. That's an accurate depiction of it. Very simple. The building on the right is a state-of-the-art house. It has many layers. <clears throat> a lot more. It has insulation. It has its thinking about air tightness and uh, vapor uh, movement. So it's a, a much more complex concept of an envelope. And so that's a big change between uh, in the last 70 years that, that we're dealing with as architects. Uh, additionally, mechanical systems, the same situation. Uh, this may seem like an exaggeration, but it really isn't. Um, most of the buildings you've studied in architectural history had no mechanical system. Um, if it was a building in Europe in the, uh, you know, around 1200, for example, or before, um, beautiful castle or um, large mansion, you know, public building of some kind, um, it's, uh, um, there would have been no chimney. And so if there was a, a heat load and a fire, they would just often had just open fires inside. Uh, so, you know, pretty primitive by our standards. And now we have, uh, like on the right, you know, the, the, the buildings that are pretty much choked with <laughs> mechanical systems or they have a, a mechanical systems play a big role. Uh, and, um, you know, this, this video is, is showing, it's just somebody uh, talking about Revit and modeling mechanical systems in Revit. This is just the mechanical systems in a building. There are no walls or uh, any architecture here, uh, in, in any spatial architecture, but it looks like a building. Uh, and the point here is that if we don't, as architects, consider uh, mechanical systems uh, from the beginning of the design process, then they are going to drive our design. We need to, we need to control the mechanical systems by uh, thinking about them early, how big they are, um, you know, how much performance we, we demand from them. So, what does that mean in terms of this thermal model workflow that we're talking about? This is a, um, a simple plan that we're going to use for a, a daylighting analysis that we're going to uh, do coming up. Uh, and I'm going to use it uh, as a first large scale thermal analysis uh, scheme. And so what do we have? I mean, again, I'm not trying to make a design here. I'm just trying to make something that, that's useful for our um, to learning these workflows. So I just have a series of uh, open offices and conference rooms in the middle with um, a core that's, you know, service, uh, elevator, stairs, mechanical, etc. cetera. Um, so if I, and this, this, the idea would be, this would be multiple stores, stories would be the same. Of course, there's going to be a lobby and other floors that are different, but um, this would be repeated. So if I were to make a thermal model of this, um, I might just create something like, like this. Uh, and why is that? Well, um, we have a bunch of prototype building models so um, that uh, we, we, we've talked about ASHRAE 90.1. Um, it's the it's the standard that we that's used in the International Energy uh, Conservation Code, for example. So it's how we're slowly bringing our building stock up to contemporary energy um, efficiency and comfort internal comfort sta standard needs. Um, and so in for this, I'm using a medium office building prototype wherein we have perimeter zones, they're about 15 feet wide, that um, uh, one for each facing of the building and then a large interior core. So the point here is that these are not rooms. These are thermal zones, and so they could be rooms. They don't have to be. This could get much more nuanced, and it doesn't have to stay in this kind of regimented uh, layout, but that's what we're going to use for right now. And um, you know we can talk about on your studio projects what you should what you should pick and really it's going to be a matter of just uh, experimenting too. Uh, okay, so that's why we have these different zones. By the way, these need to be just like with the windows that we talked about. If you're making thermal zones, they have to be coplanar um, where they intersect. If not, they will not. Um, Energy Plus won't know what to do with them. So 
Um, if you need my help in the modeling um, world uh, or platform of, of Rhino as to how to get these things to work, then definitely ask me. But that's not what I'm talking about now. Okay, so my point is that we have um, th that this is sort of a, a depiction of this thermally, or it's least defensible. That's a way we would do this. Um, and again, the reason we have four perimeter zones is because our friendly sun, um, you know, obviously there's going to be a different uh, relationship or a different thermal environment. Um, let me turn my sun on for a second just to make the point. You know, over here on the east and on the west, then on the south um, as we move through the year. And um, so that is reflected in um, in our zonal approach. All right, so let's use these zones and I'm going to, so then we're just going to repeat them, make three, make three floors. So we're going to say this is the, the, the bottom floor down here um, and this is, this is the roof. So it's a three-story building, we're going to say. And let's use this as a way of um, seeing how buildings have changed in the last 70 years by running some different simulations with different settings uh, corresponding to, the, to those changes. And I've already run them. I'm going to show up. You know, I'll go in and look at some of the, the settings. One thing to say is it's a good idea to keep track of your simulations as you start running more complicated ones. Um, I have, you know, this is a spreadsheet I was using for this. Uh, I named my runs, uh, kept track of what I was changing by using a different color. And um, then I have a, um, a summary sheet. If you guys need help with uh, Excel, let me know. Uh, because it's a good skill to, to start learning. Um, use, I use it all the time, and you would too if you, as you, if you learn it. <laughs> uh, okay. Anyway, um, so first, I set up. I wanted to see. Um, I wanted to run a, a a simulation of a 1960 prototype building. Um, you know, again, thinking about the Guggenheim or other, you know, the Salk Institute and uh, uh, you know other famous buildings that are incredible, but we really wouldn't couldn't build now because um, they're just we, things have changed so much. Um, they wouldn't be legal to code. Okay, so um, what is what do I mean by this 1960s baseline? So and also by the way, it's it's important to name all of your your simulation runs and name them fairly clearly, uh, so you can cue yourself as to what's changing. And then, like, you know, I have, um, you know, these uh, runs are, are the same as these. And so the, the summaries um, are similar. So you got to be organized. Okay. So let's go and look at, so I'm saying that the first run is a, a 1960 baseline building. And by the way, I'm not right now differentiating any of these zones. I'm just going to use them. I'm going to make them the same use setting the same template uh, and that's because I want to compare things apples to apples right now and then we can differentiate later okay so if I um, oops sorry oh yeah come back to my thermal window and let's look at um, the template I uh, created for this 1960s baseline I, um, I'm going to keep the people density the same and the metabolic rate. We talked about this a little bit earlier. This is just people are, are heaters, and so we're always putting heat into the environment. So we need to know how much heat we're putting in, how many people, and how, how active we are. I used a very high equipment power density, thinking that this is 1960, and these are not, the, the equipment's not going to be very energy efficient. We don't have any heat pumps, for example. Um, uh, I use a high lighting power density because I'm thinking it's all incandescent lights. I'm not having any dimming, so no solar controlled. Uh, you know, when we uh, so when we have daylighting coming in, that we turn the lights off. I think that would be accurate. Um, I I'm not. I think that I'm, I won't change my heating and uh, cooling settings from contemporary levels. Um, I'm going to have humidity control on, so we're always going to be uh, keeping the humidity between 80 and 20. I don't really know if 
a building if the Guggenheim at that time or you know a building like this would have had humidity control but I'm just gonna have it on right now I'm gonna start with no mechanical system no mechanical ventilation and no windows so this is not a, a occupiable building at this point I'm just want to compare I want to see what a build you know what a building with a contemporary envelope and a building with an older envelope how they the difference in how they perform um, and then I have basically all of these um, preset or these um, assemblies that I've created for my roof and exterior wall, et cetera, are concrete. So really no insulation. Let me, while we're here, though, show you how you can choose these and change them So, uh, or make your own custom uh, assemblies. So if I, if I check choose the roof, this is what I want to... Um, you know, define my envelope for. First, I, you know, remember that we've gone over this before, but um, we've got a U value up here. The reciprocal of that is the R value. So just get used to those numbers and what they mean. Uh, we also, in this model, are talking about the thermal capacitance, which is means how much heat the, um, the material, the assembly will hold. And that's because uh, it, it, it just helps. It's a, it's a more nuanced way of looking at how heat's moving through the envelope. Then we also have our embodied carbon um, uh, values so that that can be part of our carbon footprint, which is important these days. Uh, and we'll talk about that when we talk about Local Law 97. And so then we have one layer. It's concrete. So maybe it's better to choose a different. Uh, I had created a test down here. Um, well, actually, let me just show you how I did that. If I want to create a new... So default construction is pretty much concrete in uh, uh, Climate Studio. If I want to create a new envelope, I'm going to, or uh, assembly, I'm going to select one I want to use as my baseline and then um, hit uh, duplicate and I can rename it. So I'll name this uh, test two. Sorry. And so now I can uh, come down and edit test two that I just created. And I can add whatever layers I want. So here's my default material, the concrete. Actually, I'll just change the name of it. I'm going to, there's all sorts of different concretes in here. So now I'm in the uh, materials library. Um, I want reinforced concrete 20, 30 MPA. It's going to have, some of these don't have, I want to find materials that have carbon numbers so that I can, those can be included in my uh, uh, the, the simulation results. Um, and let's say I do want to add some insulation. Maybe I'll add insulation on both sides. Um, well, no, let's just do it in one place. So uh, now I've selected a material. And by the way, so this the concrete right now is 0.8 feet thick. Uh, I'm going to edit this material, pick some kind of insulation, or I can just type in insulation. Um, it just doesn't matter. I'm going to pick EPS, make it um, you know a foot thick if I want, and now I have outside concrete, inside um, the insulation. I'd actually would like to flip that, so I'm going to do this. And so now I've got outside insulation, inside concrete. I've got the layers over here and the the full. So now we have a huge heart value R1 because I have a foot of insulation R60. So that's how I would create. Um, custom assemblies and but anyway so what I what I did for 1960s was just um, essentially all concrete I have a fairly high air change um, uh, air, air infiltration rate so it's leaky uh, that would be probably mostly true through the windows um, concrete can be pretty tight but I don't know how uh, that's one thing that's changed a lot is that we're, we're building airtight now and we used to not um, and then I'm not going to worry about my uh, cost and carbon settings right now. So then I ran, um, I ran this baseline and came up with a site EUI energy use intensity of 248. That's the main thing I'm going to be talking about because uh, I just want to um, I want to look at the effects of changing mechanical systems and other settings on um, our performance. So I won't really analyze too much, um, uh, you know, why this is going on, but let's just look at it. We've got a um, heating load and a cooling load, blue. So red is heating, blue is cooling. That's convenient. And, you know, one thing we'll see is we have no windows here, so that's kind of pointless to even look at this right now. But um, 
this is the main thing, the main output you're, you're, you're getting in the thermal analysis, so you should really study them and, and learn how they work. I've talked about them in other videos. Okay, so the next thing, I, the, the next I'm going to add, um, I'm going to change some of the loads that um, we were just, um, went over. So, and again, I'm not going to maybe go through all of these, but, um, and I actually don't have that template anymore, but I can just show you what, um, so what I did, oh, and I have the, the summary chart here. Um, I improved the equipment and power density, so I brought those to uh, current 90.1 standard levels, and I added load schedules. So let me show you what that is. If um, if I want to say that, not just that there's um, and I, there's there's a load schedule here already, um, not just that there are people, um, and actually this. Just so you're not confused, this is a different number of people. I think this is for a house. So I just opened up some random um, template. Um, so if I if I want to say, well, when are people in the building? When is this heat from the people happening? I can schedule when they're there. And so if I click on that scheduling tab, I can um, look for occupancy and um, set. You know, I can just try different ones. Um, or I can uh, pick one that's a standard or whatever. This makes sense, right? People are here um, during the workday and they're not here. Well, actually, in this case, this is for uh, for residential, so they are here at night, not during the workday. And I can do the same thing for equipment and for lighting uh, and for hot water if I wanted to. So I can change the scheduling on that. And what I I um. For this one, I just said it mainly it was the power density and, and the and scheduling of the when the people are there and when the equipment is on. Uh, and by making those changes, so that's a, that's a an upgrade to uh, you know more contemporary standards. Um, I see I that's that's a huge change, right? So I went from 248 to 146 just with some basic um, upgrades to um, controls and um, better equipment and for example the lighting now is not incandescence it's uh, more in the, uh, toward leds then i uh updated the 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 heating and cooling system i uh changed the uh the cop the coefficient of performance um making them uh giving basically uh, putting heat pumps in the building uh and that um drastically reduced so now we're let's see um so before, th this is with the heat pumps, 62, uh, and before we were at 146. And so um, what's the point here? Is that I am uh, running all these zones as the same, you know, they're just uh, open office, meaning that these are um, offices without walls. And I'm not doing anything but changing settings that, that are um, making the building contemporary from a mechanical system standpoint. Um, and now I'm, uh, you know, uh, went from 248 to 62. Now this building though has no windows, has no ventilation, so it's not livable. So the next thing I did was add ventilation, and that means that we're. Let's just go look at what ventilation is. Actually, let's do it this way. I'll, I'll edit um, one of my zones. Brings me more quickly to it. If I go to conditioning. Um, and again, this is a, a different setting. I mean, this is for a, a different run of this um, than we're talking about. But um, what I changed uh, on, on this run was the COP of the uh, heat and cooling system. I made these three, which is pretty good. But it's um, you see here they had uh, they already had 3.4 for uh, the cooling COP. So this is like a, a heat pump, and the other was some kind of gas. Uh, boiler I think that we had set at. Anyway, the point is I upgraded the COP so we have a, a contemporary me mechanical system uh, and uh, oh, but I was actually talking about ventilation. So let me go back and show that. Um, oops, let's do it here again. It's faster. Um, the ventilation when we turn on ventilation, now we're talking about, actually, let me just go to a more sensible template. Uh, 
Um, if I turn on the, vent the, the ventilation, um, I am now needing to talk about how much uh, fresh air is coming in for um, uh, per person or per square foot. Um, and what does that mean? Well, I, we need fresh air to live. Uh, and so I always have to ha have fresh air coming into the building. What's happening though now? Why, um, when I add that in, so that's this run, adding in ventilation, uh, we, we our site EUI goes up. Why would that be true? Well, you think about it. If we're outside, it's, um, it's the winter and it's 30 degrees outside. And inside, we've created a temperature of 68 or 70 degrees, whatever our set point is. Uh, and But we need fresh air. So we're bringing in this cold outdoor air into our uh, interior space so that we can live in there. And we're going to lose a lot of the, you know, we're going to be, be uh, replacing nice warm air with cold air. And we're going to have to warm that air up. So uh, that's an inefficient um, way of doing things. Uh, something that we've uh, made big strides in recently is so something called energy recovery ventilation, which is a, uh, basically means that we can bring in uh, fresh outdoor air and exchange the heat and uh, humidity that's in the stale outgoing air and not lose energy that way. So in other words, it's 25 degrees outside, 68 degrees inside. We bring in, uh, and let's say it's, you know, 60 or 50% relative humidity inside and uh, lower outside. We pass those air volumes uh, near each other with a very simple piece of equipment uh, that has a fan. And then we're exhausting maybe 30 degree air and bringing in 60 degree air. So we're maybe, you know, keeping 60% of our heat um, but we're getting all fresh air. And so when I make that change and I add energy recovery, uh, recovery ventilation in the next uh, run, now I'm back to where I, I was with no ventilation. So that's kind of a magical thing that we're getting fresh air now without losing energy. Whereas when we didn't um, have the energy recovery ventilation, um, you know, we had a much higher EUI. All right, so then... The next thing I'm going to do is upgrade the, get, get, again, we still have no windows. I'm going to upgrade the building envelope, in other words, the opaque envelope, the assembly uh, that's solid, that's not, that's not glass, to contemporary standards, uh, well, to a pretty high level of uh, contemporary standard. I'm going to bring it to the 90.1 uh, energy code. Um, and let's just look with that. Let's see what that looks like. Here's a 90.1 baseline that I set up. Um, okay, so um, we have, uh, this is our roof envelope. Um, we've got some insulation outside, concrete uh, uh, as the structure, and our value about 31. That's, you know, decent. Um, the wall is um let's see stucco mineral wool this is a your a kind of a, well we could do this in the us now too mineral wool insulation on the outside concrete carpet um that's oh i'm sorry hit floor let's look at a wall oh, maybe i did use the, yeah i used floor there and there was a reason i did that but anyway you see that it's it's an insulated the reason i changed it to that is because the the 90.1 standard um, was like an R11 wall, and I didn't. I wanted something more, so I took a little bit of license. Um, okay, so what I'm saying is, I just I changed the um, assemblies for the opaque envelope, and what effect did that have? We're down to uh, a site EUI of 25, so we went from um, 248. 1960s building with really no mechanical system or no I'm sorry with a uh, very clunky mechanical system uh, improved the the loading the schedules um, uh, imp then improved the mechanical system added energy recovery ventilation and now we've improved the envelope the opaque envelope and we're um, down to 25 from 248 but we don't have glass so let's add some glass um, 
I'm going to go back first and add glass to the 1960s envelope, so the, the all concrete envelope, and I'm going to use the default glazing, which if we, let's just go look at some glazing. Um, the default glazing is just a single pane. Um, it has a U value of 1, which means an R value of 1, so very low. Very high solar heat gain coefficient, 90%, uh, and also very high visible transmittance. So this is, and this is the way, um, this is not legal anymore, but like, for example, Ed Hall has single pane glass, at least in um, the, a lot of it. Okay, so if I run that simulation, I get, um, I'm back way up right 259 um, which is higher than um, the original so when we add glass it makes it worse in terms of a thermal performance which makes sense because the glass is a very low uh, resistance to heat flow and it lets sun in um, and out um, or it lets heat in and out well that's what the low resistance to heat flow is but then it can also um, we can gain heat from it by the sun coming in which we may want but we can also overheat at some points uh, anyway, so uh, the point is adding that glass, and let me just turn on the visual. I added, so by the way, remember that what's in the visual graphic window is not the same as, as what's in the simulations window, and um, so what is here is what's being run, and so I had, I, I, when I add glass, I, I am adding a lot of it. This is basically a 70% um, glazing, 30% um, opaque envelope so um, it's a curtain wall so then if I come back and add so what we've done is we, we had added that glass to the 1960s envelope then I added I changed back to the um, 90.1 better thermally uh, um, insulated envelope and now we're back much lower, so we're, we're 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 doing fine. But we're because we're still we're using very high performance components, but we um, are way below where we were with no glass. So that single pane glass, so that's with no glass. This is um, with glass. Oops, this is with glass. That single pane glass added to our heat load. And let's just go look at, you know, our, so if we're looking at um, the, uh, let's see, let's look at before we had, no, I guess the first time we, we added glazing, um, and we can go down and look at our energy flows. So this is where we start seeing if we compare it to something that had no glass. Uh, let's go to this. Right. Um, we see when we add the glass, we get heat gains. So the orange is the is glass. Heat a lot of heat gains in the summer, not as many in the winter. A lot of a lot of loss in the winter through the glass because it has that low uh, U value um, or low R value, high U value. So we need to fix that, or well, we need to bring that up to further contemporary standards. Um, I'm sorry, I, I realize I'm moving really quickly through these. I'm just trying to make a point here, and I don't, you know, I don't want to go on forever. Um, the so this was our 90.1 baseline at 25. This is with the the uh, default glass, so the single pane, and now we're going to upgrade that glass. Um, so here we are at 35. Um, EUI and um, actually let's do this this is why I'm struggling here let me get this up to here um, okay uh, now we're going to upgrade to 90.1 glass in other words contemporary double pane um, glass so we're going from single pane to double pane uh, and so we drop our EUI quite a bit let's see what we um, what effect we have 
And yeah, you see, so we have higher solar heat gain here. In other words, we're getting more gains in the in the the, the summer. Um, and now that's uh, decreased quite a bit uh, when we add the double pane glass. So let's go remind ourselves what that is. Fine. Uh, I'm going to. Oops, that's not. Let me do. Find some glass. I'm going to. Uh, it was actually already on this, but I'll show you how I found it. Uh, I just put in 90.1 uh, to go to the 90.1 standard uh, settings. I'm going to go to non residential climate zone 4. This is where we are. And pick, um, like, let's see. We'll say it's metal framing, curtain wall. What are the. the, the um, we have a U value of 0.36, where we had uh, 1 before, a solar heat gain coefficient of 0.36, where we had 0.9 before, and a visible transmittance much lower than we had before, which may be good or bad. And so that, when we apply it, means we have a uh, much higher performance. Um, I kept going from there. And again, remember, I'm uh, keeping track of this here in my summary table. Uh, I added even higher performance glass to drop this lower. It didn't have a huge effect. It cost more. This was triple pane glass that had um, a much higher R value and um, an even lower solar heat gain coefficient. Um, so the point is that I'm now at, a, you know, I'm at 28 um, site EUI. Oops, I don't go down that far. I've got a lot of models in here. Started out at 248, I think it was, and now we're at 28. Um, and that's by changing the mechanical system and um, bringing everything up to contemporary energy efficiency standards um, from the 1960s baseline. And we did all of that without changing anything about the physical uh, space. So it's not affecting our architectural design. But it is affecting our design process because the mechanical system may have a different size than we may need to have ducts in a place where we weren't we wouldn't have in 1960. Um, we may need uh, a little bit more space for insulation, so the wall may be thicker. Um, these are all they seem like details, but if you don't think about them early in your process, then they can get engineered out uh, because uh, they, there's some the other decision was made that gets in the way of them. At this point, then, I started experimenting with shading. So now I'm talking about physical changes to the to the uh, the design. Um, and you know, you're used to probably adding shading in your studio projects and saying maybe doing a you know a, some kind of graphic at the sun being blocked. But now we can get exact with this. So the first uh, and and really understand how it's affecting the performance of our of our building. Um, the first shading that I added was well, actually, when I went back and I looked at my son and I said okay uh, let me turn off my shading you know I asked myself well you know when is when is do I maybe want to well actually even if I go back to um, let's see my last run that I'm looking at you know I've still got a fair amount of, of gain in the uh, from these windows in the summer when uh, I don't want it, so maybe I could get rid of that with shading. Um, so then I would I would look at I don't know exactly which windows that's um, coming from, you know, um, but uh, and it's to some degree coming from all of them because we're going to have a, a higher temperature outside than inside, and our windows are not going to be as insulative as the walls, so they're going to lose heat uh, more quickly, um, you know, from our from the interior. Anyway, um, so that I, I can, you know, surmise. I mean, and for some of these things I should know already. I should know that the, you know, the sun is going to rise very far to the east and set far to the west in the summer, and and um, rise far to the southeast and set far to the southwest in the the winter, and that's the dynamic that's going on. So um, as I, you know, if I'm in, if it's 
early in the morning. Obviously, I'm going to have you know more sun on the east side, and um, the time of year is going to affect it. And so I would study that visually first, and then make uh, some decisions on what I would want to try for shading. So the first thing I did was just said, okay, I'm going to really just completely block the east and west glass and see if that's having a large effect, um, to see if it's really worth um, or, or how um, how much uh, of an intervention I, I should try. So I ran that, and um, let's see, it did improve. Uh, Let's see, 28, that's um, 28 uh, to 26 is about a 10% improvement. So that's definitely nothing to sneeze at. So yeah, maybe it's worth trying to do some east-west shading here. Um, remember when I'm adding shading, uh, we've, went, we've been over this, but um, I have to add it in the actual... The, the run itself. So I don't know what this is, you know, whatever settings this was from the last run I did in this model. The point is um, we need to add this shading um, as a shading object here if we were going to run it. So I'm not doing any of that. I'm just showing you runs I've already run before. And I'll show you the shading that, that is represented by the run here in the graphics window. So that was the first one I did. So how? So I said, well, okay, let me approximate that <laughs> with um, something much smaller and more practical and see, you know, how much uh, shading I actually need. So that was this run. Got halfway there, so about a 5% improvement. So let me, then I thought, okay, well, how, how can I take it further? I said, what, um, oh, and, and by the way, I had... had really high performance glass uh, from a previous run, right? So I said, well, what if I just try that same shading with a cheaper glass? And I saw that, well, you know, actually that's great that I got um, the same, uh, I can use less expensive glass and get the same effect um, with the shading. So I'm heading in the right direction. But, and again, I, you know, we're architects. This needs to be uh, added for, um, you know, it needs to fit our, uh, other architectural um, goals, and so changing glass or changing or adding shading, you know, um, that, that's going to be something that we think about from a lot of different angles. Uh, next, I tried. Let's see. I tried egg crates because uh, you know, remember that if we, you know, if we're in. I don't want to get too much in sh into shading because we've already talked about it. Uh, but uh, if I'm in the, let's see, I'm in the afternoon, and it's, uh, you know, it's a time I don't want the sun coming in, um, the angle of the sun um, is, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, so let me just turn that on. You know, it's it's very low in the sky and coming uh, pretty normal to the glass. So if I, um, it's quarter of the time of year it is. You know, it's it's possible that uh, there's there's certain times of day when having egg crates, having horizontal shading is going to block a lot of the sun a lot more than this vertical. So the idea is is changing the um, the geometry of the shading itself. So, and what did that do? Didn't do much. So in this particular situation, it um, doesn't seem like maybe the egg crates is really a necessary addition, at least with this, this glazing package. Then I tried um, adding some glazing to the south, added it to the north just for a consistency, but I don't think there's going to be much of an effect since there's no direct sun coming in from there. Um, and... Ran that, and so all these are, you know, we're, we're getting changes in the um, the amount of sun coming in, but it's sort of like we're getting a little bit less uh, gain in the in the winter, but we're maybe getting um, less gain, and I mean in the summer, but we're also getting less gain in the winter, and that we needed that gain, um, so it becomes a wash. We need the gain, in other words, to um, lower our heating loads. Um, okay, so now. 
so the shading let's see um in this incarnation we're like about a five percent improvement from um or a little bit more in our um uh, energy efficiency so if we wanted to have the shading um it for architectural reasons and, and view reasons it's definitely not hurting anything and it's helping some and so maybe it's worth it from a, per, a performance standpoint also and these are things we could get into much more detail with um in, in helping us to make those decisions um Okay, let's see if we can go further. Um, I then went and uh, upgraded my envelope to even a higher standard, more insulation, and I improved the infiltration rate um, because we can do that. If we're, if we're talking about new construction, we should make it as airtight as we can, uh, and that has a big effect. So I went from now 27, um, a site EUI of 27 to one of 17. Um, and that's just at adding some insulation and um, changing the way we construct the, the envelope so that it's more airtight. Of course, something I'm not covering here is that we should definitely consider using less glazing and seeing what effect that has. Um, so I'm just being, you know, I'm just barreling through to sh show a sort of a, um, a workflow point out that the mechanical system settings and things like air tightness are very important in terms of meeting benchmarks that we're going to set for ourselves. Um, so I'm not going to deal with that. I, I tried some different glazing that I'm not going to uh, talk about. Uh, but the next big jump that I made was I added natural ventilation. Uh, and that got us um, some, some uh, reduction in, in site EUI. Why would that be true? So if I'm here, um, and let's let's go look at where, where we're at. Yeah, so we basically only have cooling load now, um, and that is uh, oops, wrong thing. Sorry, <laughs> ah, I keep hitting the wrong button. Okay, there we go. Um, our cooling load right now. What it's going to do is uh, see we don't really have. We have a large cooling load here, which is this gray, because we don't have a lot of losses, um, or we would like to add some losses to, to um, you know, re reduce these gains here. Um, and if this isn't clear, you guys got to ask me, because this chart can be confusing. I'm just so used to looking at it. Remember that, so we got this black line, that's zero. And then we have to create a balance between losses and gains, because that mean, the zero means that at, when we're at zero, we are um, we have the, the internal temperature and environment that, that we have decided we wanted to have, um, and so we're we have to balance losses to gains to keep that to maintain that um, status quo. So if we have a bunch of gains here in the summer, we've got to um, counterbalance those with gain uh, with uh, with losses, and that means a loss. Um, if we don't have many that are from the pa passive sources, then we need to, to increase our mechanical uh, cooling, which is what this long uh, gray bar is. Okay. So what's going to happen when I add that natural ventilation is we're going to get more losses here because we're going to be taking out heat through the windows. And so you see that's what happened here. And so a bunch of other stuff changed, which actually was not exactly uh, helpful, but the overall effect was to give us a reduction from 17 to 15. And let's just say that this is now sort of the state of the art uh, uh, high performance building. And we've gone from a site EUI of 248 to a site EUI of 15. We have added some, uh, some shading, um, which we could um, take or leave or adjust to our architectural desires. Um, we've maybe made the building envelope thicker, um, or maybe not if we were using concrete before. Uh, we're, we're having to think about the space our mechanical systems are taking up and where we're going to put them. Um, so that's an, an added um, step for our architecture. And we're, we'll, there's another workflow that we'll talk about that will help us with that.